Welcome back, everyone. Uh, we're ready for Stories of the Week, which is brought to you by Anapsis, the leading provider of solutions to protect ERP systems from cyber attacks. Customers can secure their SAP and Oracle business critical platforms from espionage, sabotage, and financial fraud risks. Visit them on the web at anapsis.com. And by Pony Express. Check out the Community Edition and turn your Nexus 7 into a lean, mean, pen-testing machine. For all those hard-to-reach places, there's Pony Express. Visit them on the web at PonyExpress.com. Welcome back, everyone. Mr. Michael Santarcangelo is with us. Did I say that right? You know what? It sounded right, but I, I may be immune to it now. Yeah, wow. Yay! Soul See? star. It's... Three cocktails in, I can say your name right. That's the <laughs> magic amount, Mike, to saying your name is three cocktails. Who, who made them? Did you make them yourself? Jack made them. Oh. And they're fantastic, as usual. <laughs> and, of course, not Kevin and Joff are still with us, and Jack is still at the bar. We're going to continue on with stories, though. I've got some interesting ones. I'm trying to figure out where I want to I wanna start. I wanted to start because Mike and I were talking, and I put one in there just for you, Mike. And Oh, it was how to incentivize people to actually doing security. Hold on. I'll find it. Reverse engineering incentives. This yeah. comes from uh, Gunnar Peterson's blog. Do you know Gunnar? All right. Uh, I've never met him, but I, so, I, his work is fantastic. So. Yeah, he says, so in 1980, Walmart implemented a shrink incentive. So if the store holds shrinkage or theft below a certain level, the difference in the amount is associated, uh, reflected in the associate's pay. So they reported their shrinkage level after implementing the program was half of their competitors. So that was one way they incentivized their employees to be more secure, right? Shrinkage? Shrinkage, Yes. Kind of that's like the, you, that's a nice way of saying theft. Theft, yes. Or when you get out of a cold pool. Um, so and wait, there's no way to reduce that. No. He often <laughs> said that, um, that no one wants to write insecure code, and he's wondering if this model could work in InfoSec. Could a company put a fixed number each year towards an average breach cost, and then if one does not occur, credit it back to the tech staff, developers, and sysadmins? And Mike, since you've written about the topic of breaches, I wanted to kind of turn that over to you first and see what you think of that kind of incentive program. I think I think it's a fantastic um, concept. I, I I am not deeply familiar with what Walmart did, and uh, I just pulled up this now. And uh, Gunnar spent a lot of there's a he's got a lot of really good detail in it. So uh, at the risk of countermanding anything he said or or repeating anything he said, here's my quick kind of take on it, just based on a little bit that we've looked at. I wouldn't limit it to the tech staff, the de developers, and the sysadmins. The other thing, too, is, is I get nervous. I, I like something he's got here in terms of the average breach cost, but then it, it, it slips right back into prevention. Yeah. Um, I, I, I like the idea, though, of, of focusing on we're allocating X number of dollars towards this type of thing happening. And if it doesn't, we all benefit. Right. I mean, I, I, I just did some stuff talking with folks this week where we looked at um, – you know, 95% of our users are using applications with access to glorious amounts of data. They can do wonderful things with it. We've got no visibility into any of it. Mm -hmm. So if we take people out of that, like if we take the whole organization out of the mix, we've missed a big opportunity. Because, uh, you know, go back to, to the thing that's really interesting. We call it shrinkage. That's fine. We're saying theft. If there's less theft, left, less theft, well, I'll say that. There is a bit of I haven't even been drinking. Yeah. If, if there's <laughs> less too. theft, the, yeah. yeah, maybe, right? Yeah. After three, magically, I can say That's less right. theft. Basically, if we work together and we reduce the theft, we get more money in our paycheck. Mm -hmm. the, the good thing about that is that's really straightforward. Mm -hmm. I, I get it, right? Someone steals something, that's theft. Someone doesn't steal something, that's not theft. So we talk about breaches and we talk about the cost of breaches. It's a little bit more complex. But the idea of basically saying, hey, as a company, we've set aside this big pool of dollars to deal with it. And whatever's left at the end of the year, we have a nice party or we give it back to you guys. I, I love that as a concept. I think it's great. Jeff, I just, I Jeff what do you it. think uh, in terms of being a pen tester, right? Uh, do you think there should be some kind of incentive for, I mean, maybe not passing a pen test, but maybe going a whole year pen test included some kind of incentive for all the employees? Because as Mike says, I agree. It's not just the sysadmins or the tech people. It's the users, too. I mean, a lot of times you're duping the users in, in a pen test, right? Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think it's actually more important to uh, uh, provide incentives for the employees rather than the tech staff because 
honestly, the, the employees themselves are going to be, um, uh, you know, they're on the front lines, right? They're, they're much more yeah. uh, accountable in many ways for, for that first level breach that's going to occur. So if, if they are provided incentives for reporting early and reporting often uh, and, and really talking about what's going on on their desktops, that's going to make a tremendous difference. Let, let me jump on something that, that Jeff just said. I think it's really important, and, and, and I'm going to actually back into it this way. I would be really careful to say we want to pass our pen tests. I, I would rather have a pen test that reveals an area I can focus on and improve than have my attacker prove that to me. Yeah. So, mm. so the pen tests, if you, if you get findings, I'd actually celebrate the findings as long as I do something with it. But, but you know, the, the thing that always irritates me about uh, awareness lately is, is we seem to think that if we say awareness, it's magically everything. There's only one outcome that can come from awareness. You've got the sense that something's not right and you report it. So that means you've got comfort knowing who to call, what website to hit, what email to send, whatever that is. If we incentivize people with money at the end of the year and all we attach it to is something seems awry, send an email, make a phone call, tell yeah. whomever these identified people are. I'm willing to bet uh, we'd see a huge difference. And I'll tell you, if any organization heads down that path, I'd, I'd love to chat with them and see if we can't figure it out and, and help them get it right. Because that's if we started yeah. showing that that worked. That's I, I do. Th I do think there's a chat. There's a there's a challenge of potential overreach as well. I mean, the, the, the real challenge here is going to be getting it right um, and tuning it. Because, you know, if you if you reach out to the entire organizations and say, OK, look, there's an incentive here. You can get you're going to get some extra dollars if you report early, often and, and so forth. Um, you may end up setting up some sort of peer competition in the organization. Right. Uh, so you're going to have to be a little bit careful about how you structure that. But if you, mm. you know, if you tune it and structure it right, uh, I think the payoff is, is potentially tremendously good. Uh, and, and I think when I say tune it and structure it right, I, th I, I think it needs to be appropriately linked process wise with the technical part of the organization so that they're doing the right things with that data. So they're not just ignoring it, you know, because there, there is that potential for over, over uh, false positive, right? And, and people to ignore it in the tech organization. Right. It's got to be the, the correct tuning. So they're just not ignoring it. They're, they're, they're part of the, um, the winning solution. So I would like to see it. Yeah, I, I think it's a great idea. I would like to see it globally, though, reach beyond the tech organization. I think out to the employees does make sense. Mm. But they've got to have the right paths to follow. They've got to have the right processes to follow so that it is uh, appropriately tuned. And, and that will take some, you know, whoever decides to engage in it, which I think would be an, an, a huge thing, is going to take some time, like, you know, a good six, 12 months development to get it right. Now, now, Kevin, how do you see this playing out in a, you know, wireless scenario, right? A lot of what you've talked about on the previous show, right, was you, you find all these open wireless devices. You think we could incentivize people to realize that that's a security risk and prevent some of these rogue wireless devices from showing up? I, you know, I really do. I really do think so. Uh, uh, financial monetary incentives is is a great way to motivate people, and uh, security to uh, education and security are one of the hardest things that we all face every single day. So to provide some type of path to, not I wouldn't say tricking employees into being uh, more security conscious, but over time they will develop better awareness. They'll understand the technology, even if it's minimal, but they'll understand that bad, you know, open wireless is bad. And I should report that, or I connected for some reason to something I probably shouldn't have. Instead of hiding that fact, maybe actually open up and tell the security guy, "Hey, I don't know what I did, but I might have done something bad." So I actually see this being a great path. But then again, on the flip side of that, there is kind of the, the the very high false positive rate. So it really is about developing the right kind of structured path of how do you make this dead simple for an employee to report at the same time incentivize them to do so, not only uh, uh, from a monetary perspective, but this is the better for the entire organization. You know, it's I, interesting. I, I would link it, hey, Paul, if you don't mind me jumping yeah. in there, I, one of the thoughts that just occurred to me is if you link that with a training program that gives you sort of the 101 on how to get on the path mm. to these incentives, not, not that, don't make the barrier too big, but just enough so the employees are familiar with the processes they need to follow and they have some basic one-on-one -on -one training, I think you, you'd be on a, a winning formula because if you just sort of blow it out with incentives, then, then you're going to have a lot of this false, false positive stuff. 
Oh, yeah, no, look, yeah, there was, yeah, there was a talk at InfoSec World called Destroying Education and Awareness Programs. I wasn't there to see it. Me either, and I wish I was. Yeah, it was given by Dave Kennedy. So we'll have to bring of him on the show. People. Of all people. <laughs> so. Yeah, look, I, let me just go back to something real quick, though, too. What I liked about this was it wasn't incentivizing specific actions. It was galvanizing movement by saying, here's a pool of money, and whatever's left at the end of the year, we'll distribute. Yeah. And, and that's a very simplistic way to do it, and it's great because it moves people towards a common goal, just like the Walmart example. Here's the other thing that comes from it, too. We talk about tuning and everything else. You know, uh, trying to force feed people uh, 50 topics because, you know, may, they should magically understand is, is, um, is a recipe for failure. Instead, what this does is if you pay attention to what people are reporting on and you see a trend, the same thing repeatedly, but from multiple people, you want to know what you should focus on educating people about? or training them about, that's it. Like, mm -hmm. th like the, the beauty to this is you'll get the evidence you need to figure out where to spend your dollars and your effort. And because people are already paying attention to those things, they're naturally interested in it. So when you say, hey, you guys want to learn about X, Y, and Z? We, I mean, we know 60% of you report on this. You want to learn about it and how to prevent or avoid it or whatever? Yeah, people will do it. And so I, I, think, I, think, there's, I think there's a lot of merit in this. Um, I think it's, it's kind of interesting. But I think it would be, uh, be interesting to get Dave's build, perspective on it, too. You could almost build in a graduated program, too, because if the ones that were willing to go further, then provide them a little extra incentive. You know, I mean, if, you know, if they're willing to engage in a, a deep level of training, then make them an extension of the security uh, group and, and let them engage in that, but, but uh, give them a little extra incentive. You know what I love about that? So here's the thing. Uh, everybody, gets a, everybody gets a shot at the pool of money, but if you've completed these extra five training courses, uh, you know, you can get a multiplier on it or you get a higher priority on it or something to that effect. Exactly. I mean, bump the incentive. incentive. Man, I love that. And, and, and then, you're, then you're really creating something where you, you're essentially creating outreach. You're, you're creating, uh, you know, an extension of the security organization, which is really exactly what we need because, you know, there's not enough of us go around. I, so. I tell you what, we need all the help we can get because if you read the latest research on bios hacking. <laughs> <laughs> That's a nice segue. Bro. Wow, you like that? Sometimes I get them right. Um, so uh, for That's those beautiful. that may not have read or heard, um, we all know what the BIOS does. It, you know, small, basically a small embedded system inside of the, your computer. Um, they all modern BIOSes have protection to prevent unauthorized modifications. Unlike many modern embedded systems, the BIOS systems have protections that prevent malicious code from getting in there, except... Researchers figured out how to bypass, bypass and reflash um, the BIOS in pretty much every major computer. Millions and millions of computers is what they reported in their extremely thorough presentation. I managed to read the slides today. I have not seen the presentation. The slides were very thorough. Some interesting things uh, about that is that um, many of the BIOSes share the same code which I think is interesting. It's something I've seen a lot in embedded systems. My take on that is it's really hard to write code for these specific chips. So when someone figures out how to do it, it essentially gets copied. And I think that the, the barrier to entry to write a web application or a common Windows application or a Linux application or a Python script, the barrier to entry is much lower for that. And you do see some code reuse there. But when you get into these smaller specialized systems, it's low-level code. It's hard to write. And there's a lot of code reuse, which means bad code gets reused more often than not. And, and that's what seems to be leading to the widespread availability from Dell, Lenovo, HP, um, and all of these systems that have this malicious code vulnerability. So, yeah. It's bad. All right. So, let me ask the... All right. So... I'm a leader in the organization. Uh, we're security. We maybe want to influence either our procurement or our controls or something like this. How, how much is this the theoretical versus applied, real world widespread, and, and I'm a CISO in an enterprise. Is this on my radar or is this rising to the level where I, I need to go down to procurement and help them understand why we need some new rules in our, in our stuff? If we go through history, in my opinion, Mike, the answer to your question would be when we see research like this presented at Black Hat, it's typically a year, maybe okay. two, before we start seeing widespread adoption and malware start, start to implement 
uh, these more advanced methods that we're talking about. So we have some time. Now, in order to affect a change like this that's actually in the hardware, and there are yeah. manufacturers working on fixes, we might need to change our processes on how we roll out new hardware and look at how we actually update the BIOS on systems that are not being replaced uh, in the next year or two. So. So this is the kind of, it, if you're not putting this on your radar, low, low burner, back burner, but the, the, the complication of getting all of these laptops and devices in our organizations updated, whether we're phasing them out or we've got some way to flash the, the, the BIOS and update it, this is actually kind of a nightmare. Yeah, I, I would say it's got to be... Logistically, it's a nightmare. You got to put it on your radar to be able to update your BIOS. And I'm, how, I mean, guys, help me out. How many organizations have you had conversations with about who updates their BIOS? Is that part of your regular patching I'm process? even trying to remember the last time I did it. Dude, yeah. who updates... Let's be candid. Who updates the firmware on their switches and routers? Yeah. Yeah, Fair point. That, yeah. That, that's, that's, that's really the, the crux of the problem that I think this is going to bring and, to light. And is there are, you know, I need some kind of cowboy magic. I that's need at hit. home, sorry. Uh, so, yeah, and I mean, we have, we have processes for that. We have tools to tell us, we have tools to tell us that we need to update our right. June OS or uh, an XOS or whatever. Uh, you know, we've got tools that help us find that. Paul and I might know of some. Mm. Let us know if you need advice. Uh, but, <laughs> you know, they're, they're tools to help us do that. And so when you get to these other things uh, or you get down to BIOS level. You may not know how big the problem is. You, you have no idea. Yeah. Um, I would say in most environments, the BIOS gets updated. When you get a new laptop. When you <laughs> replace the hardware. <laughs> right. You know, I mean, that's. That's it. I mean, listeners of this podcast um, are probably different. They're, you know, many of us have probably updated BIOS many times, but think about the average environment. Um, people well, just then, don't do it. And, well, then and let I'll, me throw something out, Jack. Let me ask your opinion on this. Uh, all, all people are, cons I know, um, <laughs> all, all people are considered equal in the organization. But then does this mean, like, from a security perspective, since, I mean, what are uh, companies still operating on a three-year refresh cycle, or have we shortened that or lengthened it? <laughs> that's a good question. I don't know. Where I that's, think the where does three that stand years. Though? I think that the three-year refresh is probably still an acceptable average, but there are feels about right. But I think there are a lot more five and six years. You know what? I would say it's probably longer than that. I would say there are a lot more five and six years. Uh, now, at the risk in, of in inciting the people, um, world. Um, you know, there, there are certainly companies that do two-year refresh cycles. Mm -hmm. um, so, I, so I get that we don't want to say that any uh, group of people in the organization is uh, more important or more vulnerable than others. But I guess one of the strategies as a leader we had better start thinking about is if I can't get these devices physically touched, flashed, updated, whatever, but we're going to count on phasing them out and rolling them out, I might have to think about the prioritization of who's got access to what, what data, yeah. what systems. No, that's a great point. Yep. Uh, so, uh, Paul, what's what's the uh, attack vector? That's that's the thing that, that I'm curious about because, you know, BIOS is low level, right? Um, and we know this. I mean, there's the whole concept of pre-infected BIOS with, you know, whatever nasty bugware that might be on it that that comes to you with. But aside from that, you know, in, in the article you're reading here, which I haven't gotten into, to be honest. What is the attack vector? I mean, this is something that can be attacked directly from the operating system? It, I believe so, from what okay. I read. There is, a, well, so you do have to, I would gather that, and it, it wasn't very clear in the presentation. Um, I'll get to the kind of big splash and how they proved it, right? But they, you would have to infect the system with some kind of malware, whether that be physically or whether you send them malware that they've run. So, the first step is to infect the system with hardware, and that malware infects the BIOS. So certainly right. having, you know, putting your defenses up about not getting malware in the first place is good. The other thing was the uh, effectiveness of the malware that they were able to put inside of the BIOS that bypassed the protections. They were stealing PGP keys and PGP secret passphrases um, from memory in, from within the BIOS. So... Yeah, that's no, how that, effective that, that's the attack clear. is. Yeah, clear but I would, I would yeah. imagine, like, it does, malware in your BIOS, that's a great point, Joff, doesn't just magically show up there. There needs to be either physical access to a you know, USB mm -hmm. or Firewire port 
or you have to get infected with malware, and it has to have the privileges in order to be able to infect that BIOS. Right, so, so to paint the entire picture, either we're going to have a two-step attack where the operating system gets infected with something and then rewrites part of the BIOS, or we're going to have a physical access kind of event right. where, where somebody you know, plugs something in which in turn boots the system and then infects the BIOS. Um, so you know, it's not quite as easy as your standard malware situation, but it's getting close to that, which to Mike's uh, concern, that raises the bar a little, right? That raises that radar from uh, if you're the, the CS, uh, CISO, mm -hmm. uh, that, that you know, this is, this is get, getting close enough to be sort of the drive-by drive -by malware kind of situation that you need to be concerned. And the, the concern for me, uh, as like, you know, Ross McCree was coming on and talking about what keeps him up at night, what would get me up at night is detecting that. Like once it's infected the BIOS, right. how do I detect that? Where, where are my tools to look inside and see if my BIOS is in Well, infected? I mean, where, is there any tools, period? I mean, that... Mm. that that give you like even something as simple as a checksum of the, all the code that's running on that BIOS. I, you know, I don't know. They have post checks, but we just sort of trust them blindly, don't we? So, yeah, good question. It's interesting. I should have linked to the presentation. Um, yeah, there is a link to the presentation. It's it's a pretty awesome. Like their slides are pretty awesome. They're pretty funny. They're informative. They've got lots of technical details that are difficult to decipher if you're not watching their presentation. Uh, certainly. So, uh, of course, you know, they say the vendor response was many vendors didn't reply to their emails and claimed they weren't vulnerable, but they are vulnerable. Uh, they did say that Dell responded is pushing patches for all of the disclosures and Lenovo responded and is releasing patches. It's unclear as to whether this affects, uh, Apple products. Um, they don't, I don't see that it readily in their presentation. But again, the problem, just like we have with embedded systems, is while there's a patch available, how many people are going to apply it? Right. I mean, and, and that's because, just to spell it out for everybody, that, that this is an individual system by system, very manual sort of process to, to patch a BIOS. Mm -hmm. It's not something that you just, this is not a next, next, finish, patch me now kind of um, entity when you're patching BIOS. So. Uh, it's 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 low level and it's uh, a very manual process, usually involving uh, creating a USB key or some sort of bootable media, and then patching it by hand. So it's it's non-trivial. How do we all feel about air gap systems? Man, you're bringing me I, back to the '90s. I love unicorns. <laughs> 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 well, Kevin, Kevin, like, how uh, often do you come across something that's truly air gapped? Right, you put a Pony Express device on it, and you're sniffing wireless and Bluetooth. Uh, just like on CSI Cyber, right? That SCADA system had Bluetooth in it. Who knew? So uh, this is kind of a funny anecdote. Um, someone once told me a story that uh, they, they do a lot of pen testing for a lot of very sensitive places, and every air gap system they've come across, they found somebody who was connecting to the Starbucks across the street. <laughs> yeah. And yeah. it's... Air gap is a misnomer, and uh, and we're talking coming segueing from BIOS hacking to air gap. There, well, there's your attack vector. I mean, mm -hmm. there, there's just yeah. Mm. yeah good so luck. <laughs> there is this new tool called Bit Whisper. It's part of some ongoing research on air gap security at Ben Gurion University. And last August, researchers at the university demonstrated another method called Air Hopper, in which they showed how it's possible for someone to serendipitously. I say that right? Serendipitously. Serendipitously. Sur sur oh, surreptitiously. Surreptitiously. Thank you. Surreptitiously. Santarcangeloli. Santarcangeloli. <laughs> extract data from a system using FS, FM waves. Uh, and this new method they're working on is actually using heat to transfer heat to so, so my, my, my understanding of that, Paul, is they're actually modulating the heat sensor to give you the ones and zeros that yes. you know, gives you data transfer, which is just... I mean, anything that's able to be modulated as a signal is a potential vector, right? right. And they're proving it with heat, of all things. So, yeah, so much for air yeah. gapping. So, so, Mike, to go back to your, like, how do I relate this to the sea level? Like, this shouldn't even reach your sea level. Like, these ridiculous ways in which people are claiming to breach air gap systems, not a concern for the sea level. Yeah, like, these, there are other ones that the use the audio, year. like the audio interfaces, and if it has a microphone and speakers, you can use that to transfer data through the microphone and speakers on frequencies that are unable to be heard by the human ear. That's another, another method. Not I feasible. also, I, I think, so basically, if I raise 
the ambient temperature where we work to like 98 degrees, then nothing yes. works anyway, right? I see this yes. in the movies all the time. That's right. <laughs> That's right. I mean, th this is by far some of the coolest research coming out. Oh, yeah. But when you have people just plugging in USB sticks they found out in the parking lot, you, you got to start at a very kind of lower <laughs> level. It's it's. This is awesome, but you're never going to see it in the wild unless you have a state-sponsored attack versus someone opening an email attachment that they shouldn't or, or, open. Or, or, or otherwise said, there are so many easier ways to get yeah, it. it, it <laughs> so yeah. once, once upon a time, there was an oil rig that uh, a machine had malware, and it was significantly air-gapped. And there was some people who tried to figure out how this machine got malware. And they actually used a product from Tenable Network Security called Nessus, which can list out the USB right. keys that have been plugged into the system. We're able to identify the system that had the USB key that was plugged into it that actually contracted the malware and trace it back to the USB key that had done it. And this is typically, like Kevin was saying, this is more how the air gap systems are being, are being breached, uh, is this type of scenario. Um, not so much these advanced methods that we talk about, which kind of brings me to my next kind of segue, I was actually listening to Risky Business when I was traveling and uh, H.D. Moore was on there and he was talking about um, segmentation and not so much traditional segmentation, but more user and application segmentation as being one of those things that can really help security. So whether it be network security or whether it be um, software segmentation, how does the, the group feel about segmentation as a general concept for, in, in fact, putting security I well, like you didn't call it segregation. That's not a good start. segregation. Well, it's, it's you know, pick your word. Isolation, you know, isolation. isolation whatever, making sorting things, sorting things out. I think is a good idea. The, the challenge is, uh, as as both HD and, and Haroon talked about in that, and yeah, Haroon is on as, there as well. As it was good to a hear a bunch Haroon. of other people have said, uh, you know, it's it's come up in in some talks I've seen and been part of the. the the move to multi-purpose computing mm -hmm. is is a point where I won't say we stopped securing systems because they weren't secure then, but we had <laughs> we had a potential in these older systems that had less flexibility to secure things. We weren't there, but there were you know research projects that brought us closer to the idea of oh if we did this with multics we could. Right make it secure. And we had, the, the, I think, the intersection of multi-purpose computing and then the consumerization of computing, right. which brought Everyone us the commoditization. Everyone a tablet, a laptop, and a right, Which brings us the commoditization of commuti computing. Yes. And um, at, at that point, um, we're screwed. And, you know, there's some potential. Early iPads, early iPhones were nowhere near as multi-purpose as modern ones, and so there was a lot less. Um, the store model, though, has matured in that time, so mm -hmm. maybe there's a trade-off. The Android model is different. You know, there have been attempts. So Cisco's made a couple of attempts at an Android-based tablet that is designed for business. And it's, you know, locked down, and it's built the way you would build a Linux system, and you can't put Angry Birds or Frozen Bubble or whatever on it, and nobody wants to use it. And so we go back, right? It's like, but this the, thing I, is, this is, it's built, it. the only way to do this is without, you know, if you don't jailbreak it, the only way to manage this is with this management tool and only approved things that Cisco approves or, you know, whoever, you know, Cisco approves them, right. it goes into the Cisco but, store, and then you've got to approve it. It's like, yeah, but Angry Birds isn't there, or, or you know, whatever the hell's not there, and so nobody wants it. So, yeah. Fruit Ninja, my family's into Fruit Ninja. Fruit well, here's, Ninja. Here's I, I finally discovered, I, I know I'm decades behind on this, there's a frozen bubble port to Android. Why did you people not tell me there's not frozen bubble port to Android? <laughs> Holy sh... I, I, I've got to <laughs> add in, I've got to add in my two cents, but I think uh, Mike was about to say something, so let me oh, allow Santak Halangelou. Jeff, my, my fellow Carolinian, please go ahead. Oh, uh, okay. Well, I, I think I stated before, I come, I come from the enterprise network space, and you know, here's, here's the problem. Carolinians, and both of you have the, that deep, thick <laughs> Carolinian <laughs> accent. We do. We, we have that. We have that. Yeah, that Someone's got to come on, on with a southern accent. Someone <laughs> help us. Someone. Hey, y'all. Yeah. 
God forbid, y'all, y'all, y'all. Uh, anyway. You know what? I, I've been down south a couple of times lately, and I actually said y'all the other day and meant it. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but did you say the plural, which is all y'all? Well, all it depends. Y'all. So that depends on Jack, what part of the south your, you're in. Bless your heart. Yeah, bless, bless your little heart. All right, uh, right, let, let, let I'm going to go use successes. the commode. Okay, the so, so I have attempted this in my past careers on, on steroids, communication segmentation specifically. Um, and the, where, you, where it falls down is that organizational realities um, get in the way of the ability to execute successfully. Um, and I think there are some vendor attempts to make that better. And when I, by that I mean the challenge with segmentation in a technical sense is you need to raise the level of awareness of that communication segmentation to the organizational boundaries within which you're operating. And the only way to do that is to join the segment, at least with current technology, the only way to do that that I know of is to join that segmentation uh, strategy in with your organizational hierarchy and to be able to execute changes very, very quickly. Otherwise, you're going to have a C-level person come down and say, this is not working, undo it now. And convenience and operations will always mm. trump security Oh yeah, uh, because that I learned that lesson business. the hard way. That Many is business times. flat out. I'd be table. So you don't undertake this lightly in any organization. You have to do it right or not do it at all. So w- the That's one so much before, more eloquent Mike, before than you, what I was going to say. Before, before, <laughs> so <laughs> thanks. My Mike. my whole thing on segmentation, <laughs> whether it's the what Jack was talking about or software segmentation or network segmentation. The thing that really gets me fired up about segmentation, we've heard me say it on the show before, is that people take their problems and issues and vulnerable stuff and they put it somewhere else and they call it segmentation and they think it's security. And that's the problem that I have well, with it, is that we never solve the problem. We just put it in a different well, place. That, like, so you have a really secure, secure Android, <coughs> right? It can install applications on it. But that doesn't mean it's secure. It doesn't mean what's running on so, it is but secure. Th- and there's, there's uh, yeah... The d- but, but you got to think of it in terms of incident response. Segmentation that's, flat out buys you time. It, it does. The other thing and, about, about and that matters. segmentation that's a related issue, and, and to Paul's point, is the idea of scope, right? So PCI, right? Everybody drink. Oh, oh, yeah. crap. Um, Just take oh, your shit, PCI said, systems yeah. and put so them in a how do we network. So you know, what's, what's, what's the best way for you to make your, uh, your, your PCI or whatever assessment uh, better? Well, de-scope everything you can, right? Reduce the scope yeah. down. Yep. Reduce the scope. Reduce the scope. Oh, that only has social security numbers, usernames, and passwords. We don't have to protect that if we isolate it from the credit card number. Mm. Oh, okay. So, so we de-scoped our entire financial organization except for a 16-digit number. Okay, there we go. There you are, Mr. QSA. Uh, now... Hopefully, there are other regulations that protect that data, but nah, not really. Not any well, other anything else that let protects me, that let data me point legally. Out the, some of the things that I've that I've seen now in the conversation, right? We we're we're discussing the solution, and as Jack said, with the word scope, and as Joff mentioned, with you know from an executive level down, we still haven't defined the problem, and we we have this we have this tendency, right? We we get excited about. Uh, a solution, and, uh, and and we'll chase after it. And it's, oh, but I got the, the answer, segmentation. Cool, what was the problem? And, and, and so what's interesting about this is we've got to get more practiced at saying, without necessarily slowing down, what's the problem that we're trying to solve? And, and then when somebody blurts it out, say, cool, wait, I don't understand. Even if you do, I don't understand. Explain it to me again. And draw the freaking picture out because segmentation might not be the right answer. But if segmentation is the right answer, uh, what Joff pointed out really artfully is that if if the organization doesn't understand what you're segmenting and why, then the likelihood of it getting thwarted or overrun is not particularly good. The likelihood then, Paul, as you pointed out, of somebody segmenting something off and going, oh, it's segmented. I mean, we're good, right? You know, it's it's um, these are techniques and uh, used an exercise in the right context. They can be effective or as Joff pointed out, they can buy you time. It's great. So the question then is still. Right, but what's the problem that we're trying to solve? And, and we're not practiced at asking that. We're, we're very practiced at reacting and pivoting and doing the best we can with what we got. And it's great. But what, what we tend to find now is that as we cycle through these things and we learn more, 
we get better at it. Ask how many people do well at role-based access control. Uh, you know, the workshop I did this mm. weekend, I had a guy point out, I was really surprised and impressed. They went from 1,500 roles to 75. So yeah, I said, so how long did it take? He said, nine months. I said, how painful was it? He said, well, actually, it took a year. It was three months of planning, nine months of execution, and it was excruciatingly painful. I said, okay. He said, how does it feel now that you have it? He goes, it works great. Okay. So, so, so the, the answer to, to Mike's point, though, is enough of us, especially in the pen testing community, need to do informative sessions on the anatomy of an attack. Okay. Mm, we need to come back and say, look, guys, this is not just your report. This is how this thing unfolded. This is the methodology. You know, we got here with a social engineering attack with an email attachment. We then used this to look for a local credential and escalate and pivoted to this other system. And this other system was in HR. And then we pivoted from that system in HR over to this system in the DMZ. And then start talking about the, you know, particularly technically, the communication barriers that were not in existence that allowed us to get where we needed to go to hack the living shit out of your organization and draw the parallels between what we are doing as penetra uh, penetration testers to how an attacker would do the exact same thing. And if you, you lay know, that out yeah. in really clear terms, well, I guarantee you, just, you the you C-level is going to yeah. go, the C-level is the first question that's going to come out of that mouth is, how do we stop this? And then you yeah, have a discussion. It, yeah, right? okay, so, so two points. First of which is, there's a technical level of the presentation and there's an executive level of that presentation. They need to be consistent. They are not the same. And right. the second part to that is as soon as you've got that person's attention and they go, whoa, bad, what do we do about it? How do I prevent it? The first answer needs to be take a deep breath and say, I'm not sure we can always prevent it. Let's talk about how quickly we can detect it and how smartly we can respond to it. And that will inform what we can do to prevent it. Like, because we're so quick to go, yep. I, yeah, well, uh, boss, if I had this, I'll prevent it. No, you won't. Mm. You won't. Wait a minute, no, it's a it, it, no it Mike, it's, it, a it's, a, it's exactly where I was going with it. And, you know, I harp on the segmentation thing, but it, and I know it's not going to work 100% of the time, which is why I like to poke holes in it. However, if you do some <laughs> level of segmentation, you can slow down your attacker so that you might be able to catch them more quickly, right? Servers in the DMZ, they can't talk to each other. Right? There's some logs that happen when that happens. Wait, and if wait, they have limited wait, access, wait, maybe there's some other flags not they can only get certain ports. To, yeah, but, but yeah. you're missing the point, Paul. It's a pro, what, to Michael's point, it's a pros and cons discussion. You come back to the C level and you say, look, guys, we could do this. We could do some communication segmentation here. This is what it means from positive perspective in the security context. But this is what it means from a negative perspective in the operational context. Yeah. So you choose. Right. Well, guys, listen, okay. any, anytime we can advance that conversation or if there's anything that I could do to write about parts of it, Joff, you're very passionate about this. You're, you're basically local to me. Um, I, I'm in. I mean, these, these are the discussions that we need to have. And, and what I loved about what came out of this is we talked about how to frame it and how to have some of those levels. We're Look, the, the data is all around us. The boardroom is paying attention. The executives are paying attention. We've got to stop saying they don't care. They don't get it. They totally care. They may not fully understand it. By the way, their job isn't to understand it the way we do. We've got to start looking for ways to translate that. If we want to have these conversations, that's great. But we need to start putting down some of those translations for people to do better. You know yeah, what? And, I think, and I think those translations start at the very top. When you go to them, you say, what does the structure of your organization look like? That's the very first question. Yeah. You know, and by the way, most people can't answer that. And, and so let me just use this as a pivot. There's a way to ask it that sounds like you're being brash and you're being a jerk. There's also a way to say, hey, guys, the best way I can, I can provide a service here, the best way I can be a leader, right? Most people who are considered IT leaders today, it's a title, and then they're considered a technical resource. So mm -hmm. congratulations, you've got a leadership position, you've got all the challenges to it. Nobody understands what you do, and you're still seen as a step forward and say, let's map it out. Let's put it up. Because typically what you show them is a really hot mess. And they look at it and they go, that's a hot mess. And you go, cool, let's fix it. I'm going to help, and in the process of improving our capabilities, I'll know what to secure. I'll know where to put the protections because the thought that we can protect everything is is fantastic. If you believe that, let me know how your unicorn, uh, you know, what it eats because it doesn't work. <laughs> so here's something I think we need to segment, and that's web browsers because all four major browsers took, took a stomping at the Pwn to Own hacking competition, paying more than 442 
thousand dollars for 21 critical bugs in all four major browsers as well as windows flash and adobe reader uh chrome fell which was uh of course google's browser that has been touted as famously hard to compromise that fell as well now keep in mind people develop these exploits like nine months before the competition and they hold on to them until the competition so they can get paid um but i think that the browser is certainly something we need to look at. We just shouldn't use web browsers anymore. I, I think the world would be a better place. Go back to you, links. Yeah, go back. To, go even for, links has uh, vulnerabilities. Back, no for. web browser. W get. No more web browsing. Yeah. W so, gets had but vulnerabilities. Let me ask, yes, so, I know. That's, that's, you <laughs> set this up. I mean, people hold off on these exploits. What does having this competition do? I mean, it makes yeah, for a neat that's headline. A, everybody falls. That's exactly what it does, Mike. It, it ends up for a headline. People get paid lots of money. Then we, we hear about these flaws. I mean, the fact is that browsers have lots of vulnerabilities, and they get picked on in this in this competition. But I think that it speaks to the architecture of these browsers and how important they are to our security, and just how well flawed they tend to be, because they're trying to do too much stuff, in my opinion. Um, I think we could do a better job building protections into the browser, but you know, to Jack's point, we're just going to build more code that has the potential to be vulnerable, which is, I think, is a cycle that or, we're in. Or with web we're browsers. gonna we're gonna build extensions or add-ons or plugins yes. or whatever you want For to call security them, that, that that give us the functionality back in the browser that you took out yep. to secure it. Mm -hmm. well, let, well, let's it, take, it, take a step back for a second and realize uh, that, uh, that ash of we can see this from kind of a higher perspective that the browser is, you know, it's vulnerable. It'll always be vulnerable. But to your end user, the person who is actually infecting your organization, they don't have the basic awareness that we have. You have to kind of realize that the browser is the front line for your regular employee and just a very small amount of awareness training of maybe you shouldn't download that attachment that's randomly generated characters as a, as a you know, an Excel document in an email you weren't expecting could really go a long way. This kind of kind of goes back to the, our previous conversation about segmentation. It's, it's about education for your end user. That's the person who's really on the front line for your organization. Yeah, I, I think that helps. I think, unfortunately, in the browser scenario, there are websites that get compromised that you just visit in your own. You don't necessarily have to click a malicious link. And that happens more often than not. And I think, you know, to Jack's point, so for myself to combat that, my own OPSEC, right, is I run plugins that don't automatically load JavaScript and Flash on a website. Um, do we roll those out to the organization? But then again, like you said, it kind of takes someone with some knowledge to be able to manage that. You know what I mean? that. Here's, here's the deal, right? The browser is becoming the operating system. It this is. is something you guys are missing in this conversation. It is completely becoming the operating system, and until some of the defense technologies from the actual operating system research itself migrate into the browser, yep. we're going to lose. I agree. Mm. Uh, look, I think there's a secondary challenge here, and, and we're going to go way past my coding ability, which is you know typing in my email address. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we keep focusing on prevention. We've still got the bias. The, the question, well, it's broken. Yeah, noted. So far, I haven't seen a perfect piece of software. And I've been doing this for 20 years. There's people who've been doing it longer. They still haven't seen it. So what I'm curious about then is how do we start to build these ever complex solutions that allow us to rapidly detect when something has gone astray and either take corrective action alert. I, I don't know. But I, I think... Trying to, to build the perfect browser is uh, is neat. You can park that right next to the unicorn. But in, in the meantime, crying about the fact that, yep, they broke it again, yep, they broke it again, yep, they broke it. Okay, great. So what? I guess the question is, what other strategies do we have to minimize the impact of these things instead of simply preventing them? I, that goes back right back to H.G. Moore's point that he made about sandboxing and segmenting. You segment the browser so it can't access anything else. But then, of Which course, people find just, ways. Yeah, what I just said. And you were talking about that too, Joff. But, you know, then people find ways around the sandbox uh, until we build a better sandbox. We went through the same thing with virtualization um, and cloud. And we have all those sandboxes up in the cloud now. And how easy or difficult it is to break out of those you know, I think still remains to be seen. It goes through it goes through fits and starts like anything else, right? You know? It's we build a better mousetrap and then people figure out a way out and then we get a little better and it just kinda goes in fits and starts. And where does it end? I don't know. But isn't this well, is it kind of synonymous with the kind of the RF research we were just talking about breaking into BIOSes and, and heat mapping? Mm -hmm. These are kind of exploits that take months to develop from the top tier researchers versus a user downloading uh, an infected file. 
Right. So where do you, I mean, it's a cost benefit analysis. Where do you put your resources into? Does the browser protect you against a sandbox and a PDF? Or do you go and try and protect against this guy who spent nine months developing a zero day? It's, it's true. No, that's it's a right great question. point. Yeah, no, where do you focus right your question. efforts? Yeah, I think that the, the mass exploitation techniques is something we need to we need to focus on. To kind of speak to Mike's point, I, I think we still struggle, and Jack, you've talked about this on the show before, we struggle to deploy a securely configured and fully patched browser to the large enterprise, or small enterprise for that yeah, matter. I, I, it's one of our struggles. Right. So, I mean, if you want to know how hard that is to do with modern browsers, there are a couple of different companies that offer, you know, so Mozilla's got a browser check tool. Mm -hmm. Uh, there are others that have tools to check all your plugins. Um, and then so you run, you know, pick your tool. Uh, you know, pick, your, pick your tool for, for checking your browsers to make sure they're up to date. So if you don't have a tool that does it for you and you just want to make sure, so you fire up every browser, everybody's got three browsers on everything they own, right? Mm -hmm. Because HTML5, as cool as it is, is it has brought us back to the 90s with browser compatibility nightmares. Uh, yep. So you, the first thing you do is you do about, you know, help or about check for updates. And then you go down that list. And even using the tools, you go through, you know, two tools across three or four browsers. Yep. And then you check the updates. And then you look at uh, a couple other places. And so, you know, you, depending on how long it's been since you've done that, you, you spend 10, 20, 25 minutes. And now your personal laptop that you travel with has its browser safe. <laughs> um <laughs> So now, yeah, we, right. so, we so haven't a checked, near impossible now, task for a technologist. We, we haven't really checked the OS, right? We haven't checked the OS. We haven't checked our PDF reader. We haven't reader, checked Flash or PDF right? We haven't yep. checked PDF mm -hmm. or Flash or the OS. We haven't checked the the weird um, video editing tool that we found, you know, the, the freeware that yeah. used to be a cool and safe tool. Has, have we checked that lately? We, you know, so, <laughs> all right, so we spend an hour looking for holes, and then we spend an hour fixing holes, mm. and then we go to DEF CON and then re-image the box and we get home anyway, <laughs> right? And, and then we yell at, to, to, to back to, you know, Pat's point, if anybody saw the, his rant uh, video about, uh, you know, victim shaming, um, I know that Michael likes to shame. No, wait, that's wrong. Um, <laughs> no, I um, feel shame. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you know, it's, and then we tell people they're dumb because... The, you know, an environment with 20,000 machines ha had one person whose job was to, I don't know, process payroll or to sell shit to people. You had or one job. to solve, you know, customer problems uh, was on a machine that wasn't OpenBSD, right? And, and a hardened OpenBSD at that. And so we make fun of the company. It's got air gapped. Air gapped, right? Yeah. With the proper BIOS. So this stuff's hard. <laughs> and then, and then I sometimes, when that spirals out of control, I get into my economist state, and which is really upsets everybody in the industry. Um, which is there's really nothing wrong because if if the economics of this total fiasco of security didn't work for enterprise, uh, it would be addressed. And since enterprise you just has yet chip and pin, Jack. I, if. <laughs> no, no, we're not going there tonight, Michael. We're not going there. Oh, you, hey, you, oh, you had shaming. to say, I can bring up you, pulled, you pulled the chip and so pin the string. Chip and <laughs> chin. I'm going to say it one more time. There's a snake I know, I know. in my you booth. I want to buy a train ticket in Amsterdam at 11 o'clock at night on a Saturday. I, I, I don't care. All of you, take your security and stuff it. I want to be slightly <laughs> tipsy after a great <laughs> evening somewhere other than in the United States. <laughs> And have a credit card in my hand <laughs> and get to my hotel. I don't care about your security crap. <laughs> I forget it. I, I want to be standing IP there in Amsterdam. Screw IP tables. I, I want be, my server to work. I want to be in London or Amsterdam or Utrecht or Oslo or Berlin or Würzburg or Frankfurt. I want to, uh, oh, <laughs> eh, eh? <laughs> do, 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 do. yes, get on the train, you filthy American. Uh, but no, <laughs> no. So not only can I not still not get on the train, now we have a feeble version of chip and pin. So we're re-architecting it all. We're not making the end user experience better. We're not making the consumer experience better. And we are getting an incremental improvement in um, how big the increment is, we could argue forever, in security. But we're also, which nobody makes a big deal about, 
shifting blame um, back to the user, right? Because if you if chip and pin or chip and sig means that uh, is the end of card present fraud, then you know in, in the U.S. carrier, the U.S. banks haven't said this yet, but you know in Europe, if you've got chip and pin uh, and something goes wrong, somebody does manage to do math magic, you're out the money. It's like a debit card. You know so, what? If that happens here, I'm going to reverse my opinion and I'm going to embrace chip and pin fully. You want to you want to fix credit card <laughs> fraud? You want to fix fix credit card fraud tomorrow? It's not a, it's not a problem, but carry on. So, so, yeah, so you want to fix it globally tomorrow? Uh, yes. The, the consumer is responsible for the 50, first fifty dollars of fraud. Yeah, I I don't huh. have an argument because yeah. if if I'd it costs it. me, whether it's my fault for losing the card. Or the bank's fault, or Jimmy's lawnmower's shop, shop fault for not take, protecting my data. If it costs me fifty dollars out of pocket, I am sure as hell not going to buy at that big box store. Instead of well, it didn't cost me anything, um, I'm not going. I'm going to be a little more careful with my cards. We just came full circle to the top of the show, didn't we? Uh, we did. How do we, we, did. How do we just, monetarily yes. incentivize yes. behavior? That's so exactly it, what we did. But as you said, Michael. The fraud rates are sufficiently low that yep. with unless you're in that lower mid tier of credit card processing, it doesn't cost you anything. If you're at the top of the food chain, bottom of the food chain, um, it doesn't cost you enough. And and even the people that get hammered, it doesn't cost them enough to make them a, change. The, the, the hidden piece to this, and, and this is the same thing in all security. So so uh, now that I pulled the string, I'll, I'll back away gently. Uh, there, there's a cost, right? There's a, there's a cost of doing business. There's a cost of convenience to stuff, and and we always want to try to squish all those costs out. But sometimes there's just there's a carrying cost, and and that's okay. With that, we'll take a short break. Come back and wrap up the show. Thanks for listening, everyone. The question for this show's free T-shirt giveaway, what was featured first on this episode? What camera shot was featured first? I'll give you a hint. It was a new camera shot we had going on the show. I don't. Was it in the recorded video? Was it in? Negative. No, it was just on the live stream. So if you can guess what camera angle, camera shot was on the, the live stream at the beginning of the show, we'll send you a free I, hack I naked like, T-shirt. It, it was me, right? It was me. No, it was definitely me. No, no, it was definitely. No, me. no, 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 it was me. <laughs> Next time we need a better question. <laughs> <laughs> it was air gapped. It was air gapped. It was That's air gapped. It was air gapped. <laughs> uh, uh, Mike, not Kevin, and Joff, thank you very much for joining us, our discussion this evening, and joining on the lines via Skype. Mr. Jack Thant. Jack Thaniel? Daniel? <laughs> Thanks for the cocktail. So he got <laughs> Santarcangelo right, but Daniel. <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> Santarcangelo. So, and you said conversation. That was more of a serial uh, rant, but that's usually what it is. Serial rant. <laughs> yes, that's what we should call the segment, a serial Get rant. Get your lucky charms. That's right. <sighs> and with that, Jack, take us out. Over and out. Well, that seemed a little bit.